I grew up in the Midwest and I was a more or less an obsessive athlete. The only way that I really knew how to express myself was physically until the age of about 16. My favorite sport was football. And when I was a junior in high school, I, had a, I was a linebacker. I had a serious knee injury. So I found myself in the hospital. And I've never known how my parents had the good instinct or knowledge to even know who this person was back in Indiana in 1972. But they brought me a book of photographs by the great French photographer Henri Cartier-Bresson and I was sitting in a hospital bed and as I went through this book called The Face of Asia, I was blown away by the way in which this person's imagery informed me of how, how rich the continuum of daily life could be if you just opened your heart and paid attention. Things that I, moments, moments I like to call Cartier diamond moments that otherwise until then, I was maybe just walking by. And I also often think that in terms of my beginnings in photography and what I was driven to express, that I have to bring into context the, the environment and the world in which I was living. And this was the late 60s, early 70s when I was, I was coming of age. It was a time when in America, there was a lot of tumult, a lot of change. Uh, the civil rights movement was at its peak. Um, the Vietnam War was, was going on. The feminist movement was beginning. It was a time when, across the board uh, in, in America and in the world, where in a way, unlike today, anyone who was 19 years old was probably not much in agreement with the values of their parents. It was a time of really questioning and questioning authority. Um, and in my case, um, I'd grown up in a household that was where my father was very passionate about civil rights and there was a lot of talk about the haves and have nots. And it happened that I went to a high school that was integrated racially by busing. It was one of the first schools in the state of Indiana that was integrated. The inner city schools in my hometown, Fort Wayne, Indiana, were, were closed and the black students from those schools were actually bused to the outlying schools. So my high school in 1972 was about 40% black, and I thought this was a great thing. I thought having a, uh, being part of a very diverse student body was a wonderful thing. But I had a sort of certain sense of frustration that I had a lot of black friends on all the sports teams that I played on. But at the end of the day, when we went home, I had a sense that in many ways we really didn't know each other's lives very well. I would go home to a more or less white middle class suburb, and my black friends would go home to the inner city of my hometown. So after seeing this book of photographs by Cartier-Bresson and now having three or four hours of time on my hands every night after school that I had never had because I had been involved in a sports practice every night, I bought a camera and every night after school I began to drive down to the inner city of my hometown, um, essentially the black inner city of my hometown. And I would park my car and I would get out and I would walk for two or three hours. And the camera became immediately about two things that, that it still to this day has been. On the, it was on the one hand, it was a pretext for entering worlds and new worlds where otherwise I might not have felt welcome. And secondly, and maybe most importantly, the camera offered me an opportunity to share and to express my feelings about these new discoveries and new, and, and, and new people that I was meeting and new worlds. I, I began nightly to go to pool halls, um, taverns, gospel churches, enter people's homes, and my world just opened up. And for the first time, I, I, I found a way to talk, which was a visual expression. Um, up until then, the only way that I knew how to express myself was essentially physically. And I would go home every night, and after dinner, I would run downstairs to the basement, and I would develop the latest roll of film that I'd made that day. And I would come upstairs, and I'd have directing a wet work prints that I had just made from the latest day's shoot. And the thing I'll never forget is showing this latest wet print, showing it around the table to my two brothers and my sister and my parents. And I'll always remember the sort of gleam in their eye and the, and the discussion that would ensue where we would talk about what I had seen that day. And in many ways, photography has while I've been now making photographs for the last 40 years, those early days of, of, of sharing what I had seen that afternoon um, 
remained for me the sort of foundation of, of my joy with visual expression and photography. I like to always say and think that first and foremost for me, photography is really not about cameras and it's not about technique, it's not about f-stops, it's not about brands, it's about it's about sharing. It's about sharing a response and obser observations, perceptions, and feelings that I have about the world around me. Sharing not only with myself, but also sharing with others for now and for time. And this notion of time is very fundamental for me. So almost from the outset, um, from the age of 16, I found a passion. I found uh, something that just felt right for me. And I went on and I went to college. Um, my freshman year of college, I worked as a photographer for the Urban Affairs Department of my hometown in Fort Wayne. I would commute between Ann Arbor, Michigan and, and Fort Wayne. I had convinced the mayor to give me a, a job to photograph the social issues of my hometown of, of, along which the city was making policy. And I had been very inspired from an early age by, besides Cartier-Bresson, by many of the really socially engaged documentary photographers, people that had used photography as a form of public service, people like Dorothea Lange, Jacob Brees, Louis Hine, the FSA photographers. And I had this kind, of, um, this kind of ideal and this dream that photography really could change the way that we, we think about the world and the way we think about each other. Um, and so after this initial job, uh, my freshman year in college, I received a, a, an offer to go out to California in the summer of 1975 to do a four-month documentary on poverty for the state of California, a department of the government called the Office of Economic Opportunity. And during that four-month period, I drove up and down the state of California in my car. I was given statistics of pockets of poverty in the state of California, but it was up to me to meet people on my own. And during that form of time, I had just this incredible sense of uh, purpose in my life, and, and it was a, a wonderful, amazing experience. At the end of that summer, I was supposed to start my junior year of college, and I came to New York with this set of photographs I made in California, and I showed them to the then photo editor of the New York Times, John Morris, and he invited me to a dinner party where he introduced me to W. Eugene Smith, the, the great American social documentary photographer, one of my heroes. And that evening I showed him these photographs of California that I'd made. And Smith, at one point during the evening, said he wanted to speak to me. And he took me aside in a, in a hallway and he whispered in my ear and he said, Peter, you have a good heart and a good eye. You can do this. Now just go out and do it. It's up to you to go out and do it. And with those words of inspiration and encouragement, I decided not to go back to college my junior year. I dropped out of college my junior year my, the, in the fall of 1975, and I, and I went to Paris. Um, I had never been outside of the Midwest, outside of a, maybe a couple family trips to the East Coast. When I landed in Paris in 1975, everything about France and Paris and the French language was just music to me. The, the language was music to my ears. It was a, a time where there was an amazing uh, vibrancy of, of, of debate. Um, the French society was divided 50-50 left and right politically. Um, unlike in America, there wasn't really a, a consensus of ideology. There was a really vigorous debate of ideology. Only three hours away, the Berlin Wall stood, and, and everything on the, to the east of the, the Berlin Wall represented a, a, a reality that was corresponding to the height of the Cold War. In Paris, I encountered people from so many different countries, cultures, languages. The world around me represented this whole new sense of history, the architecture, and suddenly so many things that I had read about in school began to make sense to me and, and really um, fuel my curiosity. And, and, and it was an extremely exciting time for me also photographically because I, I had come to the country that was the home of, of many of my heroes, of Cartier-Bresson, Robert Doineau, Edward Bouba, Brassai, Kappa, um, Cartes and, and many others, and, and the world that I had known through their photographs was all around me. And I finally found um, something academically which I loved, which was the French language and French literature. So I came back after that, that year in Paris. In the mornings I studied French at the Sorbonne, and in the afternoon 
I would I imposed upon myself um, a daily assignment to photograph the old cafes of one neighborhood, the, the Marais in Paris. And in the afternoons, every day I would I would frequent the old cafes of this neighborhood. And in order to photograph people, I had to speak to them. So I discovered that I was learning French faster than any of my classmates. And finally, after a year, I I, I went back to the University of Michigan and I. I graduated with a degree in French literature and French language. I had found something academically that I really loved. I knew that I wanted at this point to be a photographer, but I didn't know if I was ever going to be able to make a living as a photographer, but I also knew because of my passion for people like Cartier-Bresson that I had learned and discovered that they had never studied photography, that, that they had studied many other things. I knew that Cartier-Bresson had studied painting and he was very engaged social with respect to many different social issues. So I decided from an early time that I was never going to study photography. That the thing that really could inspire my vision was what I knew about the world. So after graduating from college, I I moved home, I worked on a highway road crew building concrete highways for a year, and I put aside I saved every penny I made and in the fall of nineteen seventy eight with twenty thousand dollars in my pocket I went to Paris and I immediately got a job working as a, a printer in probably the, the greatest black and white photo lab in the history of photography, Picto, where Cartier-Bresson's Cartier prints were made. I knew I didn't want to work in the dark all my life, but I, but I thought that while I didn't want to study photography that I could really learn from the men and women working in this lab. They, they were probably among the 15 greatest printers in, in the world of black and white photography. And this experience working as a printer at Picto was, was a wonderful one. On a daily basis, on a weekly basis, I would see Cartier-Bresson come in to sign his prints. I was around so many of the great European photographers, many of them were magnum photographers. And after a three month period, I also knew that I didn't want to work in the dark all my life. And I thought that while I wanted to be a photographer, that knowing more about the world could only enhance my, my vision and improve my baggage in terms of my life choices. And so I went back to a graduate school to study um, a program of international relations and political science at a very good French school called Sciences Politique. When I graduated from Sciences Po, I'm, one of the, I'm kind of proud of being one of the rare Americans to ever have a full degree from Sciences Po. I, I was actually a classmate of the French president, Sarkozy, in 1980 um, in a small economics class. And when I graduated from the school, I knew that I wanted to stay in Europe, um, but I wasn't quite sure how I was going to do it. And I had been a, a passionate um, uh, appreciator and lover of the photographs of Robert Duano, the great Paris photographer. Up until that time, ironically, now as I look back, after now having worked and traveled in over 90 countries around the world and covered, having covered most of the major news stories of the world, at that early time, my real interest was photographing in black and white the life of Paris. I, I didn't yet have a passion and desire to travel the world and, and to photograph news. And in 1981, I, out of the blue, I called Robert Duano and, and we met and he met me at a, at a cafe in front of a gallery before a gallery opening. And what struck me was for the first 45 minutes, we never talked about photography. We talked about, he wanted to know about my life, where I was from. He was very interested that this guy from Indiana had done a degree at Sciences Politique in Paris and studied international relations. And then after 45 minutes, he asked me to see my, my portfolio of, of pictures of Paris. And after looking at my pictures of Paris, he looked up at me and he said, asked me two questions. He said, do you, would you like to be my assistant? And would you, like me to introduce, would you like me to introduce you to the director of my photo agency, Rafa, which was one of the oldest photo agencies in, in Europe at that time? And I said yes to both things. So I began to go daily to Duano's home in the southern suburbs of Paris, and I, I printed many of his photographs. I assisted him occasionally on shoots. And I began to get a lot of assignments from American publications like the New York Times, Time and Newsweek, some French magazines. And in 1984, also I, I should say that on the heels of my degree in international relations, I, had, I discovered that I, I had a real passion for 
world affairs and and world politics um, and as it, and and as it happened news and I began to passionately read three or four newspapers every day and I discovered that one of the ways in which I could get freelance assignments from these publications was to make become a kind of person that the, the writers and the journalists that I, I was working with wanted to be around and and one of the key elements of that was to be able to call them and offer them ideas for stories. I realized very quickly that writers need good stories, they need good story ideas. And so I would avidly read newspapers. And it got to a point in 1981 where I was calling the bureau chief of the New York Times in Paris every day with a story idea. And I'm proud of the fact that during the period of time from 1981 to 1984 where without being on contract or being an employee, I was essentially the New York Times photographer in France. Um, Many of my ideas that I would call and convey ended up being, back then it used to be that the long feature foreign stories would be on page two of the Times. And, and I had many, many stories that were my ideas that ended up on those pages. And, and many times they were story ideas that didn't even necessarily make interesting photographs. They were just good story ideas. But that was pretty, that was fairly key to my, my entree into the world of journalism. Um, this notion of, of learning to not only think about making interesting photographs, but how to think about and, 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 and decipher and, and have a nose and an instinct for what made a good story and, and, and stories that were developing and to be able to, to glean from little things I would read either in newspapers or here on the radio or newspapers and to get, a little, to get ahead of the game, to get a jump on, on story ideas. And this led to 1984, um, the bureau chief of Newsweek called me and told me that Newsweek wanted to send me and a, a writer, a woman that I knew, that they wanted to send us out to Normandy for a month. Um, this was in May of 1984, a month before the 40th anniversary of D-Day. And they wanted us to do a, 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 both a photo story and a written narrative they corresponded to all of the stories that we could come across of, of living people that had experienced D-Day. Well, this, this was just an absolutely beautiful experience for me because when we went out to Normandy, I now encountered men and women that were either French that had been living on the coast on D-Day or American soldiers, English soldiers, Canadians, Australians, German soldiers that had experienced this incredible moment in world history, in World War II, maybe one of the most glorious moments, in fact, of American military history, um, where so many men and women that were my, actually my own father's age had given their life in, in the spirit of, of, of combating for a notion of freedom. And I worked my tail off, and after that month, I came back to Paris and I had a set of slides and I went into the Paris office and showed them to the Paris bureau chief and it happened that Catherine Graham, who was the owner of the Washington Post and, and Newsweek at the time, um, happened to be in the Paris office that day and when I showed this set of slides to the Paris bureau chief, he landed on one photograph of an American veteran that was kneeling in front of a, one of the more than 10,000 pearl white crosses that are in the American cemetery in Normandy. And this gentleman was kneeling in front of the cross of one of his comrades that had died on D-Day when they both came in on June 6th, the morning of June 6th, 1944. And Fred Coleman, the bureau chief, bureau chief of Newsweek, held up that photograph, that slide to a light, and he turned to Mrs. Graham and he said, Mrs. Graham, I want to show you a photograph that Peter Turnley has just brought back from Normandy. And Mrs. Graham looked at this slide and she turned to me and she said, um, this will be the cover of our magazine, both nationally and internationally, next week. Um, and I said thank you, and I excused myself, and I went to a, a small room in the Paris Bureau, and I, I shut the door, and I sat down, and I, I looked at the ceiling, and, and I had a little cry, actually. I, I thought that this guy from Indiana, that was my, the end of my finger, I had done something that was going to touch 30 million people around the world that next week. And, that sense of empowerment, of having a voice, of, of being able to touch people, um, 
was very powerful for, for my heart and, and, and for my motivation to continue. After that, Newsweek, this was a big break for me. Newsweek offered me an annual contract. And for the next 18 years, I worked on contract for Newsweek magazine based in Paris. And it was a rather surreal um, life and lifestyle to the extent that in many ways, the world was my oyster. Um, unlike what most people expect, where they have a notion that photographers and television cameramen are, are, are called and dispatched to various hotspots around the world, it never worked with that way with, with my relationship with Newsweek. It was expected that I would read three or four newspapers a day, listen to the BBC every hour, and that I would make an assessment and an analysis of what the big story of the world was from week to week and that I would be the one that would make the phone call to the foreign photo editor of Newsweek and suggest that I needed to be here or there. And I discovered very quickly that um, if I was going to maintain a, a credibility in this relationship that, that I should never make a phone call unless I knew that I could come through and, and, and come through with, with a, the goods. That, that, so before I ever made a phone call, I ascertained if I could actually get to the place on an airplane, if I could get a visa, um, when I would arrive there, when I could get film out. This was a day and age before digital photography where um, the world was so different, you couldn't transmit photographs. The only way that a photograph could actually be published was if it actually, the, the raw film was carried on an airplane by someone back to New York. And I discovered that my connection with the study of international relations really began to, and my, pa my passion for geopolitics and world affairs really began to, to be of a service to me. Um, I went on to have 43 covers of Newsweek and over that next 18 year period of time, um, I was incredibly fortunate to have the support of a magazine and a publication that, that allowed me to, to essentially follow my heart and follow my nose and get to the places around the world that to me seemed to, to represent stories that, that were going to make a difference. Um, and many of these stories were of a, geo, uh, of a large geo, geopolitical nature. 